Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Energy Innovation Network 2021 Inspire Summit. And today we are having the summit with the overall theme, envisioning a carbon zero future. And I am the, oh, um, is my video on? Sorry, I just realized that. Okay, you can see, oh. Yep. Uh, okay. And today uh, I'm Yan Da Liu and uh, I'm the coordinator of today's event. And today we're having session three of the whole set summit with the mobilizing finance into climate, which is also the third goal of COP26. And today's event, we are in partnership with Energy Week hosted by TDK Ventures. So what is COP26? It is short for 26 Conference of Parties hosted by United Nations that brings 197 countries together to taking actions and address climate change. It will be on November this year. There are four goals of COP26. The first one is secure global net zero by mid century and keep 1.5 degrees within reach. The second one is adapt to protect communities and natural habit habitats. And, th and the third one is mobilize finance. And the fourth one is work together to deliver. Inspire Summit this year, we are having four sessions that aligns with those four goals. And we aim to have a deeper discussions on the solutions to these four goals. We've already had our session one on October 9th, 2021 with theme mitigation. And session two with theme adaptation on October 16th. You can review the past sessions on our YouTube channel. And today we're having third session, finance in partnership with TDK. And next week we'll have our final session with theme collaboration on October 30th. We're honored to have speakers from corporates listed here. And thanks to all our partners to help us prevent the event and spread out the word. Let me briefly introduce Energy Innovation Network. Our theme is Bridge Smart Mind and Advance a More Sustainable Future. And EIN was founded in 2015 in Silicon Valley. It is a global nonprofit powered by volunteers from the United States, Europe, Asian, Pacific, and Africa, with a growing presence working in the intersection of high-tech industry and the energy industry. Through events and education programs, we intend to build a global network. As you can see from the map, we have more than 3,500 members located across five continents and more than 100 regions. So we do hope to facilitate energy education and innovation to help reach a clean and sustainable future. We host the annual Inspire Summit education program. Besides, we organize monthly event study groups and webinar to help people learn and network. What is highlighted is the whole core team is volunteer based and their background is pretty diverse. So please feel free to reach out to us if you have any question or want to subscribe to our future events. Before we move to the session, I have a few things for housekeeping. Today we are using Zoom webinar and we do have Q&A function bottom on your screen. Please feel free to send out any question that you may have throughout the whole event. Also, this session is being recorded live streamed on YouTube. And also you can join our Slack channel here. 
uh, I'll send out the link in the chat box. Okay. So let's get started. Today, our event is focusing on mobilizing finance into climate. To achieve our climate goals, there is still a huge investment need. Although different sources have different estimations, but on average, it's about more than three to five trillion dollars, US dollars per year, in order to achieve the Paris Agreement ambition. As different funding tab have different risk and return preferences, they'll flow into a business cycle at various stages. That's why collaboration is very much needed. Every company, every financial form, every bank, insurer, and investor will need to change to work together to address climate change. And today, we are honored to have speakers from different asset types. Let me introduce our speakers. Anil Achuta, Investment Director and Founding Member at TDK Ventures. TDK Ventures is a corporate venture for TK corporates. And thanks TDK Ventures for being collaborator with us. Welcome Anil. Matt Coleman, Director, Strategic Partnerships at Nafila Climate. And Nafila Climate is a security-linked uh, insurance as uh, investment manager that's focused on climate. Welcome, Matt. Real McNally, Director and Senior Portfolio Manager, BlackRock's Global Renewable Power Group. He's specialized at renewable energy investment in emerging markets. Welcome, Rail. Abiyumi Alawod, lead financial sector specialist for China at World Bank. He currently, uh, he recently established a low carbon investment fund at China. Welcome, Yumi. Charles Yance, head of Asian ESG research at Macquarie Group. He specialized in ESG research for public markets. Welcome, Charles. Chris McLean, CEO of Stone Chair Capital. It is a family office that focuses on renewable energy investment in Africa. Welcome, Chris. Last but not least is our moderator, Jane Guo, co-president of EIN Innovation Network, founder and investor at Vectors Angel, which is focused on impacting investment research affiliate at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and she's specialized on climate policy and clean tech go-to-market. Next, we'll have speakers introduce their role and look forward to hear their insights. Jane, hand over to you. All right, can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for the introduction, Yanda, and uh, welcome all the panelists for joining in uh, and our awesome audience for participating. Uh, I'm Jane, uh, the moderator for today. As mentioned, I came from a mixed background of climate policy, technology to market acceleration, and the clean tech venture capital. Mobilizing finance into climate has always been my focus. Since it's so critical for our progress of combating climate change, and they also sits the inter intersection of public-private partnership. It's my honor today to moderate such a distinguished panel on this topic and share with this great group of audience. I hope today's session is a starting point for all of you to meet each other. I'm inviting you all to join our Slack channel to continue the conversation with each other and find the collaboration opportunities. We received a really nice set of questions from the audience before uh, this group, and we'll select some questions today to go through. First, we'll go through a round of introduction for each of the presenters again, and I'll ask you to introduce your organization, your work, your role, uh, and how do you think your organization is playing 
uh, to direct finance into climate. We will start uh, with our partner organization, Anil from TTK Venture. And beyond going to introduce himself, he will also provide an overview of the Energy Week and what they have been learned through the entire week. Out to you, Anil. You want me to go through the full presentation now, uh, Jane, or do you want me to wait? Yeah, so please go through the presentation now. All right. Introduce yourself and then go through the presentation. Excellent. Then I'm going to have to share my screen. Uh, can everyone see my slides? Yes. Great. Really appreciate you guys uh, providing us the opportunity to present our findings from Energy Week. Unfortunately, I won't be able to present the findings of the entire Energy Week because it's going to be about an hour long. Uh, I'm going to pick one session and talk about um, that particular session and what we learned from that session. Um, <clears throat> before that, a little bit about TDK Ventures. TDK Ventures is a uh, deep tech fund focused on um, investing in early stage uh, startups that leverage uh, fundamental material science that unlock uh, an attractive and sustainable future uh, for the world. And we are $200 million um, assets under management. And we have a single LP that is TDK Corporation, which is a Japanese electronics giant. We're based in San Jose and California. We invest in six major verticals, materials, energy, clean tech, industry 4.0, mobility and health tech. My name is Anil Lachuta. I'm an investment director and the founding member of TDK Ventures and I lead our investments in energy and health tech. When, when, before we joined, we started uh, Energy Week, we saw a lot of conferences for academics. We saw a lot of conferences where industry folks got together and we saw conferences for entrepreneurs. We never saw a conference that really brought all the three communities together. Perhaps EIN is one of them, uh, but deliberately so, we felt that we needed to bring these communities together in order to initiate critical ideas across disciplines to accelerate this energy transition and especially innovation that drives these energy transitions. And that was the goal of our Energy Week. Hence, we started um, this Energy Week, uh, a week-long uh, event. Every day, we had two hours of panel discussions and uh, five different topics, mostly focused around electrification. Um, now there's a whole lot of topics beyond electrification that one could talk about in energy transition, but we picked electrification because that's one of uh, the topics that are dear uh, and near to TDK Ventures. The first topic was on battery materials, manufacturing and battery processing. The second topic was on battery management systems, uh, battery data analytics, machine learning, and that types. The third topic was in EV charging. Um, and the fourth topic was in energy storage or long-term, long duration energy storage and grid storage. And the last topic was mining and recycling, battery recycling. These are five very dynamic uh, topics that we chose that has the cradle to grave of uh, how one could think about or cradle to cradle. Uh, uh, on, on uh, electrification, uh, on the value chain. We had a uh, uh, very strong engagement from over 100 leading startups within this um, entire panel discussions. And um, like I said before, I'm gonna pick one of our sessions and I'm gonna discuss what we learned in that. Before that, I wanna just describe how our panels were organized. It was pretty straightforward. We tried to keep it as simple as possible. Um, we had about five to seven panelists, uh, usually some from academia, some from industry, and some from the uh, investment community. And we really asked them just two questions. The two questions were, what do they believe is going to be the most impactful innovation that can be realized within the next five years? The second question was that, what was the most challenging innovation that will truly disrupt the market in about 10 years. Uh, both of these questions are supposed to be very open-ended and, uh, and yet quite thought-provoking for many people. And we not only had the panelists discuss this, 
we also had an audience come in and vote uh, for each of these answers and, and so on to keep it engaging, uh, as well as to gain feedback on how they think on, on our uh, topic. The first topic was on battery materials, battery manufacturing. You can see our star-studded panel here. On the, uh, we had uh, academics or really uh, amazing academics and academic entrepreneurs on each side of the ends of this uh, images. Shirley Meng, uh, who was a professor at UCSD, Yan Wang, uh, who was a professor at WPI, both of them have two very successful startups already. We had um, the industry juggernaut, Bob Gillian, who was one of the major forces behind the lithium ion re revolution at the largest cell maker in the world, CATL. Uh, we also had the uh, investor of Tesla, QuantumScape, uh, Joby Aviation, Redwood Materials, so on and so forth, Depender Saluja. We had someone from Policy, as well as in uh, early stage venture capital, Sarah Chamberlain, and an industry researcher and a startup researcher, uh, Arlene Damron. So you can see that we have uh, quite diverse in terms of uh, panelists on what they brought to the table. And from an audience perspective, we had about 1,193 registrants or 1,193 registrants for this particular session. And the mix of the session was about 30% academia, about 30% industry, and about 15% investor, and the rest was startups and other. So we had a pretty nice mix of uh, audience. Uh, one didn't really dominate the other. And some of the topics that were described, uh, I mean, it's, it's so long, it's two hours in topics. So we thought the best way to describe this was in a word cloud. So uh, we, we, the, the biggest words obviously resonate with the most talked about topic. Um, silicon anodes, dry electrodes, solid state, et cetera, were talked about quite a lot. And I'll go into detail on what exactly what was discussed. Here's one of the pieces of results that we got on the most impactful innovation in electrification in battery materials, battery manufacturing and processing. Um, silicon anodes uh, seem to be the clear winner in terms of realization. Um, the next was solid state battery. And the third was really, um, I, I can kind of club the dry coating and dry processing as one, as about 25%. So, uh, so it was really the top three uh, topics that was discussed and said that they would be realized in the next five years. Um, and, and as you may see, the academics were very bullish about the silicon anodes. Um, and there was a whole lot of discussion around whether solid state is really less than five years or in about 10 years. And uh, it was quite, uh, I can say that the panel was uh, quite lively. And on the question on what would be the most disruptive technology in the next 10 years, this was very, very interesting. Uh, the, 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 the resounding answer that we got from, uh, from the, um, from the panel was that battery recycling is going to be one of the major players in the next 10 years. And I honestly would even argue that battery recycling is going to be uh, the most important piece now, uh, even more so in 10 years. And we can have a lively chat about this uh, on why. Um, and obviously, the solid state uh, technologies were, were the second most important. And if I were to sort of club this in-home refrigerator for electrons and um, long duration energy storage, it, it really was both are the same. They just called it two different names. So it was long duration energy storage was, was a piece that was discussed quite a lot. And a contrarian view that was discussed was the hydrogen piece. We can talk about that uh, a little more in, in the next coming slides. So I, again, these, I'm not doing justice to these because there were two hours of conversation around each of these topics, but um, I'm going to describe this uh, because I have only less than a few minutes left. I'm going to describe the main key takeaways. The key takeaways, the first one was that full solid state batteries may provide really a game-changing benefit in the entire field of electrification, and the reason is safety. Uh, one would not have all the safety issues that one would have today, and potentially if the energy density could be improved, 
and the batteries could be charged faster, then this would really enable adoption, widespread adoption of electric cars and electric vehicles. The second thing that was talked about quite a lot was battery manufacturing, utilizing toxic solvents and chemicals in uh, uh, what we call a slurry casting in, in today's processes. Um, this is one of the most important points um, that increases the cost of battery manufacturing. So dry printing or dry coating of these electrodes, imagine taking these electrode particles and slapping them right onto a surface without doing any sort of mixing and things like that could be quite the uh, disruptor in the next uh, five to 10 years is one thing that, that came out of this. Uh, and more importantly, that would increase the sustainability and reduce the CO2 footprint of manufacturing uh, because that's the most important piece that we're all talking about for COP26 as well. Um, another piece that, was, that came out was a little bit of this chicken and egg problem. Uh, a lot of the battery um, engineering happens at the early stage and takes a whole lot of time to develop into mass manufacturing. And uh, unfortunately, uh, many panelists concluded that the US had lost the battery race uh, to China and uh, what could be done for the, to, to augment that uh, footprint for the US and even Europe uh, was local government support. So this was one of the major parts of the discussion on how one supports um, through funding and, and, and so on and workforce development and so on. And the last one was a little bit of the contrarian view uh, on uh, green hydrogen, because many people talked about uh, the utility of green hydrogen in mobility applications, but really the, the most important application that, that came out were uh, it as, as the most important application was uh, on the long duration energy storage for hydrogen um, and, or, or green hydrogen to be precise. Um, and that was one of the, key sort of disruptor that could come out from the left field uh, in the future. Uh, that was one of the key takeaways. Um, I wanted to also thank our partners uh, and supporters for TDK Ventures Energy Week, um, including Energy Innovation Network and uh, Volta Foundation, Intercalation Station, Battery Bits, MIT Energy Night, um, and Greentown Labs, Mach 49, et cetera. We really thank everyone for their support. Uh, we made Energy Week as a free event that people could register from all over the world and can actually even go see the whole videos on YouTube. So um, the talks are available free um, and just follow us, uh, TDK Ventures, uh, on YouTube and you should be able to see the videos already up. I think two of them are already up. Uh, if you have your cell phone, feel free to take a snap a picture right now. Um, we, we have an uh, energy transformation or EX as we call it, energy transformation community. Um, we have one on LinkedIn as well as on WeChat. So welcome to join uh, that. And thank you everyone for providing me the opportunity. Sorry for uh, being rushed here. Um, uh, I hope that I was able to describe some of the interesting pieces from session one. And each of these sessions had some really amazing golden nuggets as I call it. I'm happy to answer any questions. Jane, all to you. All right, thank you for um, a quick uh, snap of the Energy Week. Really great to have you here. Today, we're going to have a discussion of all different kind of asset types here. So TDD Venture represents both a corporate and also venture capital. So maybe you can spare a couple more words about what do you think is the corporate venture's role in mobilizing finance into climate? And what are the most important challenges that you're currently facing when doing investment in this very difficult hard, te uh, hard technologies? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, to answer the first one, I think every corporation has its um, responsibility to fight climate change, just like every citizen has, has a responsibility to, to fight climate change. And because TDK, we own about 110 factories, we have to be even more cognizant that we need to ourselves need to transform um, in, in minimizing carbon footprint. And along the way, we would go and make investments into companies. 
uh, that will potentially change the future. And if they, if they happen to do so for TDK, that would be even better. So that's the goal for us. Uh, like for example, we invested in a um, fuel cell company called GenCell, which went public in the Israeli market. And uh, we were very proud to say that some of the TDK factories now has gen cells, fuel cells uh, for backup power. So uh, I, I hope that that will happen TDK wide in, in all of our factories, but that's not happened yet. But certainly uh, from a corporate venture perspective, we can both spur that innovation, which is the technological innovation that needs to be there in order to fight climate change, but also we could be a consumer of that innovation. So there's a two side play uh, to this and, uh, and we feel very lucky that we are, we are in that position right now. On challenges, I mean, uh, frankly, I would say we, we face all the same challenges that every deep tech investor faces, right? Uh, most deep tech companies come out of universities and they are extremely intelligent from a technological development perspective but uh, they often don't have the right business entrepreneurs um, and the right teams to be able to go and truly address the problem from a commercial point of view. And, and bringing together that academic and industry collaboration early on um, in order to have very uh, focused markets is probably the hardest piece in deep tech because you get a lot of technical, good technical founders, but they don't necessarily always have the right sort of uh, business background to go in and, and uh, uh, commercialize those technologies. And as venture capitalists, we have a certain time limit to return the fund. And uh, if it takes too long, it, it makes it very hard to demonstrate the return on that investment. I'll stop there. I'm sure many, many other panelists could chime in here as well. All right, uh, Neil, thanks for um, a quick uh, snap of uh, corporate venture and the role of uh, deep tech investing. Uh, so uh, Matt, uh, I know you're in the reinsurance space and you do work with a lot of the companies uh, invested by uh, the deep tech uh, investors. So maybe you can introduce your organization, your work, uh, and also how your uh, organization helping, helping uh, moving climate. Uh, moving finance into climate. Sure, thank you, Jane. It's a pleasure to be here. Again, my name is Matt Coleman. Um, my personal passion is putting a dollar value on climate risk and weather risk. And so back from when I was a student and doing research, I was getting my formal training in both atmospheric science and finance. And over the past 15 years, nearly two decades, I've been working at different investment firms to understand how weather and climate variability can lead to financial risk and financial variability. My current company, Nafila, I've been working here for uh, 10 years now. And since I've been here, uh, my role has spanned a variety of different roles from um, managing partnerships, that help us source new investment opportunities or better quantify weather and climate risk, um, working with our investor relations team to educate new investors uh, who are um, prospecting our funds, and also have spent uh, quite a bit of time structuring financial products and underwriting products that uh, effectively de-risk investments of weather and climate variability. And so what Nafila does, we are an investment manager. Uh, we're the largest and oldest uh, insurance link securities manager. Um, and <clears throat> uh, generally what we do is create insurance and reinsurance and other derivative products and structure those and sell them to different sectors, institutions, governments that hold weather and climate risk. And so where we're sitting, it's an interesting place because our clients are our investors, our LPs, and they invest their capital with us. That capital supports these different insurance-like transactions. And so if the weather is bad for business, for farmers in India, or for um, 
you know, intermittent generation and revenue for renewable energy projects, looking at natural capital projects, as well as uh, other climate resilience initiatives. And we connect that capital to those institutions that hold that risk. And the, the movement of the, the value of those investments that we manage, it's linked largely to weather and climate. And so that allows us to provide diversifying returns to our investors. And so where we sit, it's, it's really at the nexus of climate and weather risk and variability, capital markets, as well as the insurance and reinsurance markets. All right, thank you, Matt. Uh, Rail, do you want to talk about your role in BlackRock? Sure, happy to. Thank you for having me here today. Um, so I sit within BlackRock's Global Renewable Power Group. We manage a little over 9.3 billion, actually it's close to nine and a half now, in, in equity investments in renewable power and clean infrastructure assets globally. Uh, our focus historically in the, you know, I've been there since inception of the platform and the inception of BlackRock's infrastructure investing franchise about 10 years ago. Um, has been OECD focused. And over the last three years, I've been working closely with a couple of colleagues on launching our first emerging market centric strategy for clean power and infrastructure. So for us, um, you know, that has been an effort in collaboration with the governments of France, Germany, Japan to build kind of a blended finance vehicle that melds both what we call catalytic capital. So kind of higher risk, higher return mission driven capital that's looking to, to you know, help crowd institutional capital into you know, what we believe to be the biggest investable opportunity of the next 30 years in the infrastructure space, which is really clean power and energy in emerging markets. So we're you know, excited to be here today, um, but really excited about the, the space and the opportunity. Um, I think there's a really huge role for both institutional capital to play coming off the sidelines um, lots of impediments with doing that. Uh, but you know, there's a huge opportunity set there ready to be to be harnessed. Lots of things need to align for it to, you know, for it to be the infrastructure investment that that institutional investors look for, which is low risk, low volatility, strong cash yield, um, high recovery rates in, in terms of default low, and, and low probability of default. So it's a lot of things that need to come together for that to all hold true um, in emerging markets. But that's why we think Vehicles like the Climate Finance Partnership, our emerging market-centric strategy, uh, are important to, to start that transition, really to help bring institutional investors to these markets, help insulate them in some ways from the idiosync additional idiosyncratic risks of being um, investors in EM markets, but really with the view to, to, to proving the thesis and starting those flows of capital um, into you know, a really, really exciting and hugely dynamic space. All right, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Chris, I know you're investing uh, renewables in Africa, so that's a, definitely an emerging market. Uh, you want to share some of your role um, and do you conquer some of the observation rail hub? You bet. The, 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 the elimination of risk is something that's often sought for, but rarely obtained when looking at Africa. Full stop. I mean, we are talking about a continent from an energy perspective that if you want to say, you know, it's 600, 800 million people don't have access to energy today. There are two utilities, national utilities that are in the black in sub-Saharan Africa. Everybody else is in the red. There's a reason for that. Most energy projects in Africa are 10 megawatts or less. Most energy developers that are going to these projects can get all the debt they want, whether it be from DFIs, whether it be from local institutions, debt is available. But where do you get this risk adjusted equity that Rail is talking about? This has been the missing piece of, of, of African institutional capital that, that we've been trying to fill. Um, you know, one of the things that Stone Chair um, uh, did uh, with the Africa Development Bank in 2019 is we launched um, our fund, uh, which is called the Hashtag Energy Africa Fund, social media into the name. And it purely looks to provide equity to 
projects, you know, of sort of that million to $10 million size to be able to say, let's start, let's be that catalytic capital, let's be the equity that's missing from so many, you know, getting so many projects to financial close or, or whatever. There is blended finance of all kinds of forms there. There's, you know, grant money, there's DFI money, there's institutional capital for development, but it's always that 30% of, 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 of equity that's missing. And it can't be riskless. Full stop. It's not. We are talking about the natural resource business with a new resource. You know, if you called it mining or oil and gas in the past, that was natural resources and that had a risk profile to it. We are now talking about different resources that are being mined, you know, on the African continent. We're talking about solar. We're talking about wind. We're talking about hydro. We're talking about um, all kinds of things that have risks associated to them that as an investor base, we're all still growing in our knowledge. So the things that Matt was talking about, you know, compounding a database of what this information is, the, the, the work that Rail's doing with BlackRock and Proparco and, and the different work in Japanese and the different organizations that are coming together. This is why we've got, you know, companies like, you know, IKEA and the Rutherfords putting a billion dollars together for emerging markets to say, okay, we need to help break this log jam. It's, there's all kinds of people that are standing on the side that are saying, hey, we know there's something there. We know there's opportunity. Yes, Africa has risk. But the way I look at it is, is this, is to say, if we all agree that by 2050, there's going to be another billion people on the African continent, right? So that's 30, 300 million people roughly per decade. That is a Europe or a North America per decade being added to the continent of Africa, which is continuing to drive down the median age in Africa even more so, which says there's less entrepreneurs that have experience. There's less, you know, there's all kinds of students that are coming out of education um, situations like Anil was talking about before. We need to find some way to get them capital to say, grow businesses be successful, stub your toe, you know, but at the end of the day, let's add energy to the continent, full stop. All right, thank you for sharing that. Um, so Yumi, you, you're with World Bank, so your role has been really helping all those developing countries. So why don't you share your experience? Thank you, Jane. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, my name is Abayomi. Uh, everybody calls me Yomi. That's much easier. Even my mother calls me Yomi. So please feel free to call me that. Um, I've been with the World Bank now for 24 years. And during that period, I've worked on a wide range of financial sector issues, ranging from development of bond markets, financial inclusion, financial stability, banking supervision, et cetera. Uh, but my current role is as a financial sector point person for China, where I do cover the entire financial system in terms of how we can make it stronger and better supportive of the real sector. And of course, given China's role in global emissions, green finance or climate finance looms large in uh, what we do. So uh, one of the key projects that we've been working on that finally came to fruition in June this year is on the establishment of a strategic low carbon investment fund in China. And listening to some of the earlier panelists, I see several elements that uh, we tried to, to bring together uh, in establishing this fund. Uh, Anil's kickoff presentation resonates because he talked about uh, things like uh, energy storage, batteries, manufacturing, etc. Uh, we had this kind of focus when we were conceiving this fund in terms of what the fund will be investing in. So we were not thinking only in terms of big energy projects or infrastructure projects that are green, 
but we're thinking of businesses that are being innovative, pushing the frontiers in terms of uh, solutions to climate change. So manufacturing was definitely high on our agenda. Uh, the other aspect that, uh, that resonates is, uh, is what uh, Chris just talked about in terms of equity. Uh, the World Bank does not have a lot of money, contrary to what uh, everybody thinks. Uh, we cannot bring $9 billion to the table uh, like BlackRock uh, can. can, can. Uh, but uh, our role is more to help develop markets and clear the bushes so that the private sector can then follow. So we focus a lot on equity uh, in this fund, which uh, ties in with what Chris was saying, because we discovered many of these enterprises and projects that are on the frontiers of pushing solutions that will address climate change actually do lack equity. They have access to debt, oodles and oodles of debt. And China is a country where uh, you have a lot of liquidity sloshing around the financial system. So our primary focus was how can we get equity into many of these businesses that are coming up with solutions to climate change. And a final point uh, is that we focus on the small and medium enterprises. In China, as many of you know, uh, the government is huge everywhere, including the financial sector. And state-owned enterprises get a lot of the financing. So private SMEs are starved of funds. And we focused on getting equity and other forms of long-term finance into the hands of these small and medium enterprises in the green space. So in some, our fund in China uh, combined those two elements, looking at companies that are pushing the frontiers in terms of green solutions, as well as making sure they get the equity that, that they need. So that is a high level summary of this uh, low carbon investment fund that we established in China uh, back in June. I can provide uh, additional details as, as required. Thank you. Thank you, Yumi. Uh, that's really awesome that World Bank is uh, playing a really critical role to engage uh, private market. Um, so we have last but not least, uh, Charles, uh, can you share your, your research on ESG and public market? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and excited to be here this morning. So I am the head of Asian ESG research at Macquarie based in Singapore. Uh, I started here basically with COVID, um, which has been interesting. But uh, prior to being at Macquarie, I covered renewables as a stock analyst at CLSA and headed up our uh, regional utility research uh, for Asia for 15 years, a bit over 15 years. Uh, now, part of the reason I joined Macquarie is because of all the work that uh, the firm is doing around renewables in particular. Uh, as everyone, I think, would know, Macquarie is a huge infrastructure investor, by many counts, the biggest in the world. I've got 11 gigawatts of operating renewables and another 30 gigawatts plus of uh, projects under development. And then there were other things within the business as well, very large commodities trading with a huge emphasis uh, right now on carbon, both voluntary markets and regulated markets. Now, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on within the group. The reality of my day job, though, is I'm firmly in the public equity side, sell side public equities. So at the end of the day, what we're doing is making stock recommendations for uh, public equity portfolio managers at BlackRock, at Fidelity, at Capital, et cetera. And specifically what I'm doing now there are two parts. Uh, so first, head up sort of uh, thematic research around a, a large, in large part renewables, but looking at uh, helping out all of these new public equity impact funds that are looking to populate their funds, all of these thematic renewables, clean tech, climate tech funds that are, are coming into existence. So we're helping uh, dig up ideas within the public equity space there. And part two of my job, which has really taken up most of my time over the past well, since I joined, uh, has been the ESG integration piece. Now, all of the public equity funds uh, everywhere, or initially in Europe, now in the US and Asia as well, do have uh, sort of an ESG integration 
uh, piece to the funds. It's absolutely uh, demanded from their asset owners, so from the pensions and from the sovereign wealth funds. Uh, and what I'm doing is kind of uh, mimicking that on the sell side. So I've set up a system for ESG scoring based on SASB, Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, uh, that all of our AD analysts around the region use to build into the stock recommendation. So the thousand stocks we cover around the region, they build this in. Um, now, look, we end up with the score. <clears throat> the scores, I, I think, are useless, you know, to paraphrase Eisenhower. Uh, you know, forecasts are useless, but the process of scoring is absolutely crucial. So this is where our analysts are digging in and, and actually starting to ask the questions like, why does my steel company, why are they not a member of RE100? Why don't they have a net zero plan? To get into these kind of questions. And really where the, the two parts of my job, so the idea generation and then the ESG scoring cross, is that there is increasing demand um, to really kind of back up with clean investments of so renewables, et cetera, to, to show that they're also doing no evil. So this, if, if we look specifically, it's a sustainable finance directive out of the EU that's driving this a lot. Um, you know, you, you have to really back up and document show, give documentation to show that the companies that you're holding are not actually engaged in anything bad and they have clear definitions of bad, et cetera. So this is, where we're kind of bringing everything together. Um, and look, it's an exciting space because we do see this really dramatic growth within the public equities uh, space as well for uh, not just ESG funds. And, and we could look over the years, there have been many ESG integrated funds, but there's a lot less patience for funds that are not really uh, working to solve climate problems in particular. And, and that's where we're seeing the growth and where we're seeing a lot of uh, issues where we had lip service previously, and now that's getting a lot more serious. So that's that's it for me, and hand back to you, Jen. Thank you, Charles. Um, yeah, so I will also uh, share a little bit of uh, my work. So I started a side project called Vector Angel when I was working for a corporate venture. Um, that I, I actually saw a lot of the really amazing technologies, early startups, uh, the, you know, the institutional investor feel a little bit hesitating to, to get in that early. So, you know, pre-seed or seed investor. Um, but I realized a lot of individuals, high networks individuals, uh, or people who just care about climate, um, they actually don't mind as much uh, as an early, very early stage uh, startup can have pretty high return for, for high risk. So I started uh, Vector Angel on the side um, to aggregate uh, angel investors' money into very early stage, uh, pre-seed or seed stage um, climate change uh, startups. And they have been doing really well. So um, yeah, so this is, uh, I think like also a role that, you know, family office can also uh, increasingly to play to encourage more uh, breakthrough innovations to uh, get into the market. Um, all right, so uh, next we will go into a roundtable discussion format. Uh, and if you want to uh, comment on any of the topics, please do that. Um, so I don't need to uh, call your name. If you want to comment, you know, uh, come on. So our next uh, discussion topics is, is where do you see a gap in financing climate? I'm happy to go first. Um, okay. <laughs> I guess, I don't know. I mean, I, I'll speak to what I know. Um, uh, what I know is early stage investing, Jane, just like you. Um, I'm very much uh, involved in early stage investing. I guess the panelists will be able to chime in on all the bigger public equity and, and debt capital and, and all the other stuff. Um, just from an early stage point of view, I think the, the biggest barrier I still feel is in the seed stage. Uh, there's a lot of pre-seed investments that people can get through angels, but there's this weird pocket of, I guess, you know, $3 million to about $10 million, where people are not, it's not really early stage venture capital, 
but it, and it's not really angel. Um, it, it's somewhat stuck in between, right? Um, and, and entrepreneurs have a real hard time trying to raise that capital. Um, and hence, I think they've, they've all kind of started raising mega A rounds nowadays. So uh, it's just like the, the seed round is kind of vanished. Uh, or or I, I even think that the A rounds are looking like B rounds. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that if, if we had a good pipeline of investors uh, doing uh, sort of three to $10 million investments, um, I think a lot of good entrepreneurs could uh, use some uh, pretty good help there uh, because that's where your innovation goes from okay, I have a prototype to, okay, is this really working at the scale at which industry wants this to work? Um, and, and, and I think that's, that's one piece of the puzzle that's still uh, out in the jury for me. Yeah, I, I certainly concur. That's a, that's a really tough uh, place for a lot of institutional to feel comfortable. Um, but you know, once but when you get in really early, uh, the return can be also humongous. So <laughs> yeah, but the institutionals yeah. don't invest there, right? They they kind of yes. you know right. um, it's but but but, it, but you're talking ultimately about we'll call it you know the way I look at it is I, I'm from Canada and that is our venture capital world, right? Uh, our junior markets are were built on you know. Is there going to be the right resource in the ground, you know, whether it be oil and gas or mining or whatever, and you have public companies that were like $5 million market caps or less, you know, that kind of thing. And this is what they did. <clears throat> and this is what globally needs to happen. And I, I agree with you 100% is to say aggregating of these type of different processes, these different companies. So it's the, I had two that won, two that lost and, and you know, you know, what is that? Six that were sort of okay, but that produces you a, a, a bedrock of return that you're able to, you know, morph out over, over the, over the whole process. And I think, you know, looking at each of these projects individually is just too onerous for any one institution, right? I mean, there's just, the idea is there's too many of them. You have to pick your space and stick with it. And, and like you said, there needs to be more people doing that doing that work. Absolutely. We need an inverse of SoftBank. <laughs> I think that's what we need. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Jay, this is Yomi. Um, there, there are two gaps that I see. Uh, one is connected with what Anil said. Uh, we, our work in the World Bank has shown that as I, as I alluded to earlier regarding the work in China, uh, we've seen this in other countries in East Asia and Pacific as well, and in parts of Africa too. Um, you don't have that long-term risk capital. Uh, as Chris said, there's always risk, right? So you don't have that many people who are willing to commit that long-term risk capital that can back those innovative solutions that are being put together by the clean, clean mines in, in, in climate, uh, uh, green and climate solutions. Um, and this was a particular challenge that, that we saw very clearly in China because you had many companies that we spoke to that were, for instance, involved in manufacturing batteries and capacitors and components of distribution and transmission infrastructure, fuses, things like that. And they wanted to expand, they wanted to, to do new things, they wanted to commercialize some of the ideas they have, but they don't have the access to this long-term risk capital. So bringing more of that into this space, I think would be very important in helping many of these countries or, the, or companies rather to, to push the frontiers, as I, as I said earlier. So that's in terms of the recipients of the funding. But on a larger scale, we also see a big gap in climate finance for emerging markets. Most of uh, what we talk about uh, relates to more matured markets. As, uh, as Chris also pointed out, uh, developing countries and, and lower income countries do not get enough of this climate finance uh, that uh, we are all talking about here today. And 
as the World Bank, we cover many of these countries. There are many of our client countries. So the big question that we've been wrestling with is how do we fill this gap to get more climate finance into Africa, for instance, and other low-income countries. And even some of the lower middle-income countries do not uh, get uh, a lot of uh, climate finance. If you look at the emerging markets, China, India, those are, those are big uh, targets for, for funding, but many others do not uh, get the same kind of attention that China and India uh, do get. Thank you. One gap that, that we see um, quite routinely is the inability to properly value weather and climate risk across both short and long time scales. You know, one example is, um, you know, we're quite active in the renewable energy sector <clears throat> in both uh, developing and developed markets. And one problem we saw there was the inability for lenders and equity investors to get comfortable with the amount of weather and climate related risk that they're taking by investing in renewable energy projects. And so what we saw was an opportunity to structure innovative financial products like revenue guarantees that can bundle those different risks together, including the generation or intermittency risk, how much rain or wind speed or sunshine is there to, to produce electricity, along with price risk, and then you know the, the timing risk of those and, and how they overlap. And what we were able to do was create a product that enabled lenders to be less conservative in the assumptions that they make uh, or, or require um, the, you know, the equity investors to make with respect to ability to, to repay mm -hmm. debt. Um, and so by, by de-risking or removing uh, an element of that, that revenue risk from those projects, Lenders are able to be less conservative. Equity holders can potentially get more leverage uh, and, and lower debt costs. And so by extracting that risk and warehousing it for our investors, we're, we're trying to help other forms of capital to, to mobilize and, and unlock value for those other stakeholders and projects like that. And the good news is there is a tremendous amount of data globally um, you know, in terms of time and space and types of weather and climate information that can be aligned with different types of business data and information like revenue and costs, asset values, um, understanding new sustainable technologies. And so with that weather and climate data that's becoming more and more available, it's, it's quite exciting because all these different stakeholders can access those data, either it's publicly available or privately available, and you know, begin to understand and quantify the relationships uh, between um, the movement of weather and climate day to day, year to year, decade to decade, and understand what that means in terms of economic or, or investment risk or, or variability. Thank you for the uh, comment. Uh, do we have other uh, person want to jump in? To be honest, I can't remember the question exactly. Uh, <laughs> so what is the funding gap in mobilizing? What, what is the funding gap? Uh, <laughs> I, I think I agree. I, I, equity, I think, is the, is the right answer. As most people have said, Look, there's a lot of mission-driven institutions willing to finance the debt piece or, or, or make those kind of really philanthropic grants or technical assistance grants and i think there's that you know, there's the two universes of equity obviously chris hit on the the smaller early stage dollars the really high risk capital that's very very difficult for institutional investors to participate in right it's very hard to build a business investing hundreds and millions and billions of dollars in five ten twenty million dollar increments because it's 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 unmanageable for, for an organization. So it requires lots of different parties to play in lots of different ways. Um, institutional investors fundamentally need scale. So, so you know, you, I think that goes to Abayomi's or Yomi's comments around like some of the markets that you see as very active, like China and India, 
Brazil, all these markets that are considered emerging markets, but really are, are pretty well established at this point, have pretty strong domestic pools of capital, have increasingly sophisticated capital markets. Um, so for us, they're, they're not the emerging markets that we're focusing for, for the Climate Finance Partnership. But equally, we can't focus on frontier markets because we have to be rational financial investors and, and fiduciaries to our LPs. We can't be going to a market trying to create a market. The market needs to be there to some extent. Uh, you know, again, I'm speaking as an institutional investor representing that that pool of capital. Um, in terms of you know things that can be done to crowd capital in, the the biggest objective risk in most markets is foreign exchange. The hardest risk to manage over time um, is foreign exchange. So, so if people can come up with creative solutions to help manage that for, you know, essentially infrastructure is a series of discounted cash flows, right? It's not multiples. It's, it's not a particularly liquid asset class. It's quite opaque. Um, emerging markets themselves are quite opaque. So when you put all that together, you know, that's really what's keeping people out. But the biggest single driver from our analysis of, of, of investment outcomes is, you know, the, the unmanageable uh, aspects of this is, is foreign exchange. And I don't think that's something that you can just ask any one individual country, DFI sovereign to guarantee or to wrap. Um, it, really, it really comes down to finding new ways to, to thread the needle around foreign exchange. There's things you can do in terms of managing your portfolio, diversifying that risk, but fundamentally, it's it's a very very significant, you know, it's a bigger risk than expropriation. It's a bigger risk than than inflation, although it is interrelated with inflation. Um, but then, from a you know, from a government perspective, it's the things like again, I'm talking about scale here, but you know, you need pipeline. You need to see a number of years of development potential. You need to see a strong regulatory framework or, or, or something that's beyond just an, an ambition that's in some way enshrined in law. Um, look at the huge opportunity and massive challenge to Chris's point here. You, know, you talk about the, uh, and Yomi's as well, that the level of electrification in a continent like Africa is so low and the land mass is enormous, right? So it's quite a, you know, it's not the same story as we've seen in Southeast Asia, which over the last 10 years has achieved incredible electrification penetration levels for, for most, most of its citizens. That's just not the same story in Africa. And we have to, we can't, there's no one size fits all. There's no broad brush answer that works. Um, but I'm excited that we're having the conversation that people are starting to think about it because we need to, we need to plug it in lots of different ways. And I think, you know, institutional capital is not typically the first capital to move into these spaces. So I'm delighted that, you know, we found a structure with the Climate Finance Partnership that's that's starting that. But again, we, we're not going to be in the frontier markets. So someone needs to be in those frontier markets. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a long road. Uh, it's, a, it's a challenge, but it's a massive opportunity to build the grid of the future, to not be encumbered by legacy structures or market norms that that exist in OECD markets because that's how they were built, because there are vested interests. It's a chance to to really see and, and challenge ourselves. Be it storage, um, wind, solar, whatever, whatever the next opportunity is in technology, software that can help us build the right sized, cost efficient um, energy solution for these markets. And it, it's going to naturally be more modular. It's going to be more diversified and hopefully, you know, more cost efficient and cost effective over time. And a huge part of that actually will come down to you know, renewables are so capital intensive day one that getting that capital structure and cost effective um, financing for those assets, particularly at utility scale, that's going to be a real driver of the overall economics um, in these markets. But we've got, to start, we've got to start moving and doing things. So. It's a very long answer to a short question. Sorry. That's a very good uh, answer to this very important question. Uh, and it's not long. We, we, we need a longer discussion. Two hours is not enough. <laughs> yeah, Charles, you want to say something? Yes, uh, thank you. So uh, really, mine is very short. Um, you know, from a public equities perspective, the clear gap is simply the number of stocks out there. So, you know, when you had this long drought in clean tech venture or before it rebranded as climate tech, 
Uh, and then also you have the collapse of yield codes, uh, you know, which had issues clearly, but gave public equity markets uh, investors an opportunity to invest in these infrastructure assets. Um, you know, with these two failings, you just don't have that many stocks. You know, within solar, within wind, within batteries, I mean, it's increasing, uh, but nowhere nearly as quickly as the demand for these equities is increasing. So that's that's the short answer is, you know, we're kind of at the end of that chain, but the public equities markets, there are not that many stocks uh, that are available for our clients. I'll, I'll chip in there, Charles, off your comment. And I agree with that 100% in that, we'll call it the small SMEs with the, you know, that idea of venture capital, junior listings to help capital inflows in different markets. If we say in the African markets with, you know, 11 different exchanges, how can we get institutions in the, on the continent investing in themselves rather than always U.S. securities, you know, for long term and that kind of thing. We need to help create um, junior capital and rotate, have that turnover of capital. And um, <clears throat> Rail, you had a great comment and I totally believe this is the future, is that technology is going to be part of what brings all of this together. For you, Charles, it's going to be um, how can we have that disclosure at all the, all the levels at a company to be able to have an institutional investor feel comfortable with this? And um, I'm quite um, happy to say that, you know, next week here, um, the... Um, World Economic Forum and the folks at KPMG um, were releasing something called net zero equity. And the whole idea of that is that from electrons being created all the way to electrons being consumed and everything in between, all the data for disclosure is going to be recorded on the blockchain. So that Charles, when you start looking at saying, how am I going to track down this information for a company? We're going to look forward and say, here's how it's going to be blockchain all the way through so that there is ultimate transparency for LPs, for institutional investors, for retail investors to be able to make their choices, to be able to say, hey, I can see what's going on here, whether it be a large project or a small project. There's only, as, as, as everybody has already said, there's only so many large projects that institutional capital can go to, right? I mean, you can only have only so many in Africa, GERD and Inga Dams or Mozambique, uh, you know, LNG projects. After that, wh where are you going to put large amounts of capital? They, they, it doesn't exist. So we have to use the, the things that, you know, um, you know, diaspora are a fabulous inspiration for a lot of this capital. They, they come to universities, schools, uh, get jobs with institutions, and they say, hey, I know a way I can do this back home. I can solve data management on my local utility grid. I can do this with whatever. These kinds of things are the innovation that we need to support. You know, there are people all across, you know, um, globally, whether, the, you know, the global north as a whole that can take technology in innovative forms to markets where it's probably used better than, you know, in the 50 states or, you know, or what have you, right? So. All right. Thank you, uh, all the panels, for all the uh, questions and comments. Um, so let's move on to the next question. Uh, what is your view of the current market conditions? Do you see some overheat in some asset types in financing climate? We talk about there's a gap, but are there way too many, way too much money moving into one area? I don't know. I, as a venture investor, I'm just happy that there's money moving into this area. And um, I, I, I'd welcome more competition in this space because uh, this is, we have only one earth and uh, uh, I, I'd want to, I'm, I'm a raging optimist here. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I really think that we need a lot more people coming in, uh, pouring capital. Yeah, you know, valuations are gonna get, you know, a little skewed. Yes, there's gonna be some failures, but I mean, do we say the same thing about software? No, right? Uh, 
Right. Um, I think if you if we look at the different sources of emissions, right? Um, everybody is excited about electric vehicles and greening the transport sector. And you also see a lot of excitement about, about greening the, the, the power, power sector as well, clean energy, hydrogen, renewable energy, and all that. Um, so I don't, I don't think we have any issues in, in terms of, of attention for those specific sectors. But when it comes to agriculture and land use and forestry, I, I don't hear a lot uh, in terms of anybody rushing in, into that segment. But in many countries, this is actually a significant contributor to, to CO2 emissions. Uh, Maybe on a global scale, it's not that huge, but for specific countries, that becomes important. So we need to bear that in mind. A couple of other sectors that used to lack attention, but I think now you are beginning to see more focus is probably industrial production. I, I have come across a lot of, in many of the countries you work in, a, a lot of attention is now focused on eco-industrial parks and making sure uh, like like I mentioned, factories are also green. Uh, green buildings is another area where you are, you are getting more attention. So over a long period of time, we'll probably focus too much on, on, on transport and power and less on agriculture, industrial production, and, and, and green building. But I think that is, that is slowly changing. Yeah, I, I agree with you. As a venture investor, uh, we do see a lot more companies that fit into the you know venture model. Uh, that's you know in the electric mobility and you know uh, renewable space. Uh, agriculture uh, innovation is a little hard to invest because even the iteration cycle can take you know two years to even test this thing actually works. Uh, so we we definitely need a, a new model. Uh, to encourage more money into uh, agriculture technology and then this sector in general. Jane, I have a little bit of a contrarian view there, right? Yeah. Um, I think if you spoke to venture investors five years ago, they probably yeah. told you even the battery stuff and all the other electrification stuff doesn't fit the venture model. Right? Yeah, um, that's so, because it's getting so cheap now. <laughs> now yeah, so, so <laughs> I, I would say, you know, I actually agree with Yomi uh, that, you know, we should have more into going into fisheries, forestation or deforestation, um, you know, water management, resource management, things like that. Um, I, I just find it very strange that, you know, only software fits the venture model kind of argument that from a lot of people, uh, especially in the Silicon Valley, if you talk to a bunch of investors, they'll tell you, uh, this is too slow. It doesn't work like SaaS and things like that. So there's a lot of good investments to be made um, in various other industries. Uh, electrification is uh, kind of getting all the love nowadays, uh, but certainly uh, there are other areas, um, industrial robotics, you know, lots of good things that are out there, agriculture, that would potentially fit the mold of the venture model. Um, it just requires an ecosystem and some, some sort of a winner to come in and sort of, uh, you know, rise the tide, right? To lift all the boats. Yes, totally agree. So I, I think we're lifting all the boats from clean tech 1.0 and now a lot of the companies uh, in, in that not the investable areas are now quite popular in the, in the investment space, which is very good to say. <laughs> So I'll you know, briefly, like overheat, I, I mean, if we just look at some of the valuations, certainly in the public equity markets, it's tempting to say that. I, I mean, particularly we cover A shares as well. And you look at the A share battery companies trading at 50 times earnings, 60 times uh, you know, price to earnings ratios. And those are kind of difficult for us to wrap our heads around because they're just completely out of whack with a lot of, okay, software maybe, but yeah, they're, they're out of whack with the other industrial companies or utilities completely. Um, so in a sense, uh, yeah, given the stage we're at in terms of the energy transition, no, uh, that's, that's not necessarily really overheated. 
but of course, there's going to be dislocation along any of these supply chains. You know, I, I don't know that these stocks have reflected the uh, inflation and polysilicon costs, or if we look at all the battery materials, are they reflecting that downstream yet? Yeah, probably not, but you know, we, we're going to get these cycles and there's no way around that. And that, certainly talking to clients and, and internally, uh, that simple fact that these are still commodities, um, yeah, that, that gets lost sometimes, surprisingly. I mean, it's a very fundamental, simple thing to grasp, but it does get lost. Uh, so, yeah, you know, we, we will experience these periods of dislocation, but uh, overall, you know, no, it doesn't, doesn't feel overheated when we look at the IEA numbers or any of the other numbers where we need to be. Yeah. Any other comments? Okay, uh, if no other comments, uh, we'll move to the uh, next question. So um, I know you're, many of you are um, asset managers, uh, you know, general partners of fund. Um, so uh, have you encountered, uh, you know, your, during your conversation with your LPs, uh, uh, what is your uh, the LP perspective? Um, who are you raising money from, uh, contributing to the asset you're, you're managing? Um, and what is the current landscape of LP's uh, climate investment? Anyone want to get started? Sure, I'll get started. So we launched our fund at the Africa Investment Forum in 2019. Um, so that was led by the Africa Development Bank in um, Johannesburg. And from there, we had um, a, a variety of DFIs, um, whether it be um, now the DFC, CDC, Islamic Development Bank, Norfund, CD, the Canadian. They were, they were at the table and all around it. The interesting thing was, is that the Americans, um, uh, OPEC at the time, now DF, DFC, brought um, half a dozen um, American uh, pensions and university funds for exposure to the environment that was there. And now you've got people like, you know, Chicago, that University of Chicago, where they're leading the charge for universities to look at infrastructure investments on the continent. But that was a seed that was planted two years ago. So that, that's really interesting to see how um, the long-term um, development of the ideas for at, at the LP level is really about understanding the environment that, that they're looking to invest in is, uh, along the way. And so, um, you know, for us, we continue to work with these different LPs and try and, you know, continue to expand on that long-term um, picture, but I got to say, having, um, you know, uh, the struggle between being a GP and the, and the often the comment that we get from so many LPs is, can you, can you have or do you have a permanent capital vehicle? That the idea of a fund or fund management in this space can't be quantified perhaps in the, in the way that, that Charles um, does for so many of them is that they want to have something that has 10 concrete tangible sides to it, right? That you can put in a box and you can say it's this or it's not this. And so that, that's real part of the discussion that we're coming up against with a lot of the different um, institutions that we're chatting with. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, look, obviously big institutional asset managers. So our investors in our in our emerging markets fund are actually very consistent with the LPs in our in our core funds. We've got more, I would say, as a per percentage of total, more high net worths family offices in this emerging markets fund. We obviously have the DFIs, which you wouldn't typically have in any of our funds, which are, are, are much more commercial in nature. Um, but we have banks, we have insurance companies, we have pension funds. So it is really the same suite of institutional investors that we've been able to attract with the emerging market strategy. I completely agree. Education is a huge component of this and it's a long lead time item. Um, 
did education and look the, the risks are real here to all the earlier comments as well so the education may not make them feel better but at least they'll they'll understand the risks better and i think i think that's important because i think the the track record historically in emerging markets particularly in power and energy and defaults in those sectors isn't as bad as people would automatically assume and certainly you know it, it's it's less prevalent than it is in north america and, and the us specifically in in that sector i think i think the other thing that kind of the preamble to this question or the, the the preceding question, which was around mispricing a risk or too much capital crowding into the space, like that that's almost necess a necessary evil to facilitate the transition in these markets is you need that mispricing. So people have to go and look for something else. They get so uncomfortable with valuations in, in markets that they're comfortable with that they've got to start to consider other things. So you know those confluence of events will be really important. Um, I, I do think that's part of the, you know, part and a contributing factor to our success in capital raising for the emerging market strategies. People acknowledge that something has to happen and it is happening and, and maybe they sat in the sidelines for too long with other things or they're they're just generally uncomfortable with where markets are at, where yields are at, where you know if they're not getting a return in their bond portfolio. Investing in infrastructure in emerging markets isn't isn't a bond substitute. It's not a you know I don't think it's a permanent capital vehicle strategy yet. Um, but it, it can get there, you know, where where maybe that's the right vehicle and structure to hold in developed markets. You have traditional operational infrastructure. That's not the life cycle stage in emerging markets. But, you know, I think capital has woken up to the fact that you know, there are opportunities out there that may be better priced than what they're seeing in the markets that they're typically uh, looking at. So, there, you know, there is an interest in getting up the curve on the opportunity set, but but education was a huge component of our, our push to capital raise, um, was putting together thought papers and pieces and really talking to LPs and doing a lot of virtual legwork over, over 2020 um, in particular to be ready for kind of 21, so. Thanks for that insight. At, uh, at Nafila, we, we manage $10 billion of capital, and the, the vast majority of that capital is from institutional investors like pension funds, endowments, uh, family offices, and the like. Um, I would say some, you know, one of the key questions that we receive on the investment opportunity side are investors wanting to understand the, the diversification that our uh, investments and, and different investment vehicles can bring to them. Um, you know, the, the presence or absence of, you know, weather and climate events um, generally has no bearing on the broader financial markets and vice versa. And so that's, that's often what we spend time addressing, helping them understand and get up to speed on um, you know, our different vehicles and the different risk return profiles. On the risk side, which has been really interesting, you know, dealing with investors and hearing their questions over two decades now, over the past maybe one to two years in particular, we have been getting more questions on the risk side, um, not just the risk that we're taking on their behalf, but more general questions about things like climate change, weather variability, just asking you know, how we think about those risks. How do we wrap our heads around them? What kinds of data do we use to try to understand you know, what, what the financial implication of these different weather and climate changes can be either in the short term or the long term. And so it's almost it's looking for some advice and thinking about where to start if, if they're these investors are thinking about, okay, you know, we're at the, the risk disclosure stage right now, listing the different um, weather and climate exposures that could impact, our, you know, uh, impact us across our investment portfolio. And there's, you know, inching toward, okay, how do we move from disclosure to quantification? Um, and so on the risk side, that's that's been quite interesting to see that change um, in recent months, you know, the past couple of years. Mm, um, two, two categories of 
of investors that we've seen recently. And I was wondering if uh, uh, some of the panelists here who, who are actually asset managers, I'm not an asset manager, obviously, but we've, uh, we've seen a lot of interest from central banks, especially the reserve management department of central banks. They want to put more of their capital uh, into green assets. And we've also seen a lot of interest from sovereign wealth funds. Um, this could be particular to a few countries, but uh, across many of the regions where the World Bank is active, we are beginning to see uh, increased understanding among central bankers and sovereign wealth funds that uh, this is an asset class that they should be looking at. So I was wondering if you've also seen that uh, on the private sector side. You want to go, Chris? Yeah, uh, Yomi, I was just going to point to um, a, a DFI event that happened <clears throat> about last year. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the African Development Bank did a $3 billion bond listed on the London Stock Exchange, and they did it in about 10 days, right? And it was their COVID relief bond. The bond was, they were ecstatic that they were getting 3% for this bond. But what came out after the fact was central banks from Europe and North America bought over 75% of it. They're at flat or negative rates and they could get her a three or five, three to five year bond at 3%. You know, I think that speaks volumes, you know, with a AAA credit DFI, you know, I think that speaks volumes to, you know, the situation that, that central banks around the world are, are facing right now. Yeah, I would just add, you know, from my perspective, most of what I see from the central banks in emerging markets is a very domestic, quite a narrow domestic focus on their home market or very adjacent markets, which is a challenging universe to pitch to institutional investors because it requires them getting very granularly up to speed in a market that they may, you know, Africa's 54 different countries, right? They may have no idea what those countries are. They may, they may know six to 10 of them. Um, you know, the more traveled may know half of that, but they don't know all 54 for sure. So how do you get their attention? How do you drive that capital? Um, we had the opposite, you know, we were, we were targeting a global strategy for all the diversification benefits, but part of the challenge we had going to some of these banks and these types was that we, we weren't narrowly focused. They wanted to give us money, but they were saying, but we want you to just, you know, do deals here. And that's, that doesn't give us the objective things that we need as a portfolio manager to build a portfolio with good risk adjusted returns, um, at least on, you know, in a spreadsheet. Um, and the other, you know, definitely sovereign wealth funds, huge opportunity for sovereign wealth funds. I think sovereign wealth funds are someone, frankly, from a, from a timing perspective and a scale perspective that I could imagine this emerging market strategy selling to, that we exit to them, but they, they really require scale at a level that even you know, beyond what we're doing with, with average LP money, they're looking for big tickets and, and conviction around markets. So markets that have been proven have been proven for a number of years, but still aren't so de-risked or well understood that they are ready for perpetual capital vehicles. Like you see CPPIB, lots of Middle Eastern sovereign wealth funds, plowing into this space in, in markets that, you know, institutional money generally isn't going to, but it's because, you know, mo those markets and the scale of those opportunities are very, you know, India, China, Brazil, again, these big, big markets, 10 years ago, it was Chile, Mexico, you know, they're willing to move early and move at scale where they see that kind of long-term pipeline that I talked to earlier and that conviction around go forward growth when they can get their arms around that you know, that forgives an awful lot. And the, back to Chris's point on kind of that relative value trade that they're making. Um, what can you get in terms of you know, risk neutral bonds elsewhere, right? Next to nothing. They're pay possibly paying away value to get security. And, and that's not, you know, their long-term objective. So, you know, they've, they've been very constructive, I think around a lot of these markets, but again, they can't be that five to 10. They can't even be 50 to a hundred. They're, they're 200 plus for, for most, you know, for most of those players. Uh, 
All right, thank you for all the all the comment. Anyone else want to uh, provide the last thoughts for this? Okay, uh, we'll move to the next question. Uh, what is your understanding of ESG investing versus climate investing? Uh, how can we get to net zero asset management? I'll go first since I didn't speak last time, I guess. Um, so I, although I am interested in what everyone has to say about this, so the, the really high level uh, view and, and what we're seeing. So over the past two years, all public equity fund managers all have to be seen to be doing something with ESG. Like five years ago, uh, sitting in Asia, very few of our clients, almost none. And in fact, most of them uh, that we did have with an interest in ESG or climate uh, were European offices in Asia, as opposed to Asian domicile funds, and, and certainly, or those who are servicing the pension funds, and especially the Nordics. Now, uh, what's interesting, what's happening now is this, this big anti-greenwashing push, which is fantastic. I mean, it's messy, and a lot of it, I think, is disingenuous. Uh, but there's also the genuine push against greenwashing. And because of this, there is more of a drive for focused funds uh, around climate in particular, because this is the one area in which uh, there are concerns about the data. Yes, absolutely. Like, like Chris alluded to, I mean, there's every survey that comes out for public equity fund managers, what's your biggest roadblock uh, for further incorporating ESG or climate into your process, it's data. Like there, you get five out of the top seven reasons are data um, and lack of trust in that data, lack of hard data. Um, and this is all multiplied in, in EM market in emerging markets as well. Uh, but now with this anti-greenwashing push, you know, the area where you could at least get a lot more comfort around the data, not total comfort, but a lot more comfort is climate. Uh, so if we're looking at whether it's looking at emissions or whether we're looking at you know, specific uh, thematics around climate, be it renewables, electrification, um, et cetera, you, you do see this drive in. And, and we're seeing that in terms of the funds that are being launched now, uh, something just out from IMF, looking at that as well. Uh, in terms of the funds that are being launched now and in, in terms of the demand that we're getting kind of anecdotally, you see that ESG investing is very much, at least for now, maybe it's just a cop effect, but uh, becoming climate, uh, it's becoming climate investing. I can go next. Um, I think labels aside, um, we would invest in anything, any technology that would bring value to society. Um, and frankly, that's TDK's motto anyway. Uh, TDK has been doing that for, I don't know, 86 plus years. Um, and uh, only nowadays, you know, we have these labels about ESG and climate, et cetera. But, you know, wherever technology plays an important role, um, I think we would go in and make investments. Uh, I think TDK has done that, like I said, and TDK Ventures will continue to do so um, in, in any area that is uh, going to add value to society. So um, I know that's a kind of a high level answer, but that's, it, it, it is central to our investment thesis is to invest in companies that do good to society. And every single company, portfolio company that we've invested in has been in that, uh, in that angle. Actually, we have every IC pitch that we go to, we have to have like Sustainable Development Goals, uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, like you know, uh, put in put in into those decks on the first slide. Uh, otherwise, we, we we won't even start the pitch. So uh, it, it's pretty uh, it's pretty central to our thesis. For us, it's um, it, it's been an interesting transition. I would say the first um, you know twenty years we've been around, we've been very focused on climate risk, understanding that and structuring financial products that help different sectors like food, energy, water, infrastructure, you know, deal with damage caused by natural catastrophes or 
variability in revenue or costs due to variable weather. And in the past couple of years, we've just seen um, an interesting opportunity to, to broaden our mandate and look at opportunities where we can apply our expertise in valuing these weather and climate risks. And so where that's led us um, looking into some new areas like natural capital projects, where you know if you are um, you know, developing land, that land may be exposed to floods or droughts, or you know, if you're if you are restoring an ecosystem, you know, hurricanes potentially causing damage or freeze causing damage to you know whatever is being grown, um, and looking at sustainable technologies, um, you know, sometimes the adoption of new technologies, say in agriculture, for example, of a farmer or a consortium of farmers, you know, to, for them to adopt. Um, new seeds or new equipment or other technologies, there, there can be a hesitancy there to do something new and to spend money on that. And so if, if we can help de-risk opportunities like that um, in sustainable technology, natural capital, bringing our understanding of, of climate risk uh, to, to the table, then that's, that's been quite exciting for us. And so now we're looking at not just climate-linked investment opportunities, but you know, broader, for lack of a better term, sustainability linked opportunities where, you know, we can apply that, that expertise that, that we've been building up over the past couple of decades. Thing about um, ESG is, as many people have already said here, is they're labels, right? So it's the how are, how is my investment affecting environment and what are the protocols I have, whether there be the things that Matt just talked about or things such as an environmental impact or it's measurable things. Governance, that's something that's quite measurable. You can say, I got disclosure. I didn't get disclosure. There is proper record keeping. Those things are quite recordable. Social is a giant variable. It, how do you measure social impact? Are, are you going to look at it with a gender lens and say, oh, the women in this community were better off because of my investment? Medicine was better off because of the investment? Climate, as this whole community looks at that differently and their small portion of the world and how they look at it? It's not measurable. It's, it's judgmental. And we can disclose it as part of the investments, but the end result is something that is very subjective to your focus and how you look at the world. You know, when we look at emerging markets or frontier markets, we have to be very careful not to look at them with our colonial past and how we're looking at them and how the things that are there for us to be able to be able to benefit. And these people are be better because we did something. Are they? Are they not? You know, it depends on what's there. Social and how that web webs into climate is such a variable that, um, you know, I don't think ESG is the right label here. We, we need to, um, as Anil already, you know, pointed out from the TDK view, I think it's a, it's a strong way of looking at how is, you know, society benefit, benefit? How is the earth benefiting from this investment? Not how is this company benefiting necessarily from that investment? But there's my two bits. All right, so uh, when you talk about climate investing, what is the role for you to use to actually account your uh, climate investing outcome? Are there any uh, that you're particularly following? We know we have SASB for ESG, but now we, we're talking about what is the climate impact from your investing? What are, what are the rules uh, you're all following right now? Well, within my group, uh, we use UN SDGs, but we've tried to dollarize them. So we've tried to find a way to regionally back it into a dollar multiple to make uh, the actual impact that we're delivering more quantifiable, obviously environmentally focused strategy. So we can imagine where the bulk of <laughs> the bulk of the score goes. But yeah, you know, there there is employment, there's there, there's a whole host of other things that we touch on. So for us, it is important to try and 
and it was an effort with kind of the BlackRock Sustainable Investing Group as well to try and build a, a methodology across our alt platform to dollarize the impact that we're having so that you can, as an investor, look at different strategies and say, well, where do I want my impact like to be? How do I want, uh, you know, how much impact is it having in that particular sustainable development goal? I, I think, you know, I believe greenwashing is real. I, I don't, you know, I think I think it's inevitable. I think the SDGs are intentionally broad to get people to adopt them because if they were narrow, people wouldn't. So you do have a lot of rebranding of existing strategies that now fit fit SDGs, and I think I think that's it's fine and it's inevitable, and that's arguably the biggest challenge to the to the prior question and getting to that net zero point is there's a lot of businesses out there that are doing things in a way that maybe isn't what it needs to be to, to meet the net zero ob objective but how do we separate what they used to do and get over what they were and and, and help them on that journey um so i think that's a big challenge for the industry more broadly but but you know none of this is a set of it's not a set of rules it's not a copy paste take the box i did that i'm definitely good it's it's a it's an objective it's not objective it's it's a hard to quantify standard um so I, I don't think it's that straightforward. So maybe not, not that helpful, but but you know, the dollarization was our attempt to make it somewhat transparent, but I'm sure you could pick holes in, in the methodology, right? It's we're using publicly published, you know, published data on averages of what water usage is in a particular region or avoided emissions is. So it's it's all imperfect, but the willingness to try and and the fact that we're all here today talking about it from you know, such a wide range of institutions coming out of, coming out the sector from so many different angles is is encouraging. But yeah, I don't have the perfect answer, but that's that's what we're doing in our team. Yeah, I actually agree with you, Rail. Uh, it's we do something very similar. Uh, we try to keep it high level again uh, because any sense of precision can be false. Right, um, so you don't want to be precisely wrong. So uh, that that is uh, what we we don't want to do. Uh, what we try to do is use uh, the SDGs as a sort of a high level um, uh, metric, and we do life cycle analysis for many of our investments, looking at where is this material coming from, where do you source it, where do you use it, how much do you use, what is the CO two footprint. Where do you deploy this? Where do you dispose this? And where does it go after, right? Just being able to understand and being cognizant about it, um, I think is a much better uh, way of thinking about it than use one metric or the other that may or may not be precise and totally agree with you, Real, and on the data as well. Many times, even that data where you get that from may or may not, may not, may or may not be correct. So uh, I think, I'm, uh, again, I'm an optimist, as I mentioned, but I'm also a pragmatist in this case. I want to make sure that, you know, we're not shooting ourselves in the foot. If I may add uh, a slightly different perspective from the World Bank groups projects across different regions. Um, we, we have realized that even when you have projects that are supposedly green or climate friendly, they may have unintended consequences, negative consequences for the environment. So we do integrate into our projects uh, what we call the environmental and social framework. And the purpose of that is to make sure that whatever uh, project or whoever is our investee uh, they, they incorporate into their risk management system a, a process for identifying potential environmental and social risks associated with the activities relating to that particular investment. So even if you are manufacturing electric vehicles or batteries, et cetera, we want you to be cognizant of all the risks that may come up in terms of the work you do or your activities, your production processes, and on the social side, uh, for us, issues like child labor, forced labor, gender-based violence are, are, are top of the agenda in terms of making sure that even if these are labeled as green and ESG 
blah, 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 you still do have in mind uh, all these factors and make sure that uh, they do not crop up uh, in the various activities. So that's one perspective uh, from our side. Thank you for the uh, for all your perspectives. Uh, so we're coming to the end of our time. So uh, let's just talk about the last question. Um, how do we collaborate uh, as SMM managers, as LPs, as development uh, banks? Um, how should we uh, collaborate uh, in order to mobilize more finance into the climate space? Well, if I, if I may go first, I think one thing we've all realized is that there's a huge investment gap. We don't have enough money going into climate. Um, and the second thing is that the public sector is not going to provide most of this money. In fact, estimates, the most optimistic estimates I've seen point to around 10 to 15% coming from the public sector. So the private sector, private capital uh, will definitely have to fill that gap. So for us as a, as a multilateral development bank, we realize that our role is to help catalyze our private capital into this space. So as I mentioned, many of the things we've done is to try and open up the markets work with governments to also have stable policy and regulatory environments. And we've also done some work relating to helping to develop pipelines. Many of the uh, panelists tonight have talked about pipelines. Actually, how do you identify a list of bankable projects? So I think as, as a development finance institution, uh, we, we need to work very closely with, with, uh, with the private sector to make sure that the enabling environment is right for this capital to move in. And we can also help in terms of some of the de-risking uh, instruments that the World Bank and the World Bank Group has. And other DFIs have these kind of instruments as well to, to make sure that we mobilize uh, private capital. So essentially, this is a task that is too big for the public sector to, to take on. So it has to be a public-private partnership uh, framework to push the envelope. Uh, in this, in this space. One final point that I want to make relates to, to definitions uh, and standards. One thing that we've come across is the fact that if you have difficulty in identifying what is green, then it becomes even more difficult to mobilize capital into, into green assets because people are not sure what exactly is green and what is not green. And as we know, there are different shades of green uh, as well. So part of the work we've been doing in the World Bank Group is also helping countries to develop and clarify taxonomies of activities that qualify as green so that we can better identify them for private capital to, to move into this space. So those, those different uh, uh, responsibilities definitely will have to be shouldered by both the private and the public sector uh, one side cannot take this on uh, by itself. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm Irish, so I know all the shades of green. Uh, but I think, yeah, public-private partnership is really, you know, obviously, what we've done with the Climate Finance Partnership. That's our jump-off point. We, we firmly believe that there's got to be better and closer collaboration between those two pools of capital. But, but you know, again, it's by, there's an education component to all of this. Um, and a lot of what, you know, again, I'm an institutional investor for, for infrastructure. So I'm, I'm not cutting edge. I'm not developing the technology. So everyone here is playing a different part of solving the same puzzle. Um, and the, you know, different pools of capital in our in our business will have different risk return profiles and diff you know, specifically different mandates. So, so you know, while I'm not willing to take the risks that Anil takes, there are pools of capital that are seeking that out. Um, so we just all, you know, we all need to just really push into this space and focus on it together. I think, I don't think public-private partnership necessarily is is going to work in Anil's group, but the, the partnerships that you see between venture and education 
that's that's fundamental and then you know for us for for the institutional money that uh, the scale that we're looking to deploy it is that kind of public private partnership so i'm sure there's there's ways we can all work together and you know certainly happy to lay off risk to matt and others that are that are able to 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 think they can manage it at least <laughs> at least charge us a fee to to help us think we're managing it but whichever the whichever the right the right summary is but uh yeah that's it that's it for my shades of green I, I guess one way that uh, we we try to collaborate is to share the how uh, when we can. Um, if we're working with our investors and helping them understand how to think about climate risk or what that means for the risk that they hold or what it means for investment opportunities, <clears throat> or if we are um, structuring financial products for our counterparties who hold risk and want to transfer it. Uh, we, we really try to meet folks where they are and, you know, share with them on the road to either sourcing investment capital for our funds or sourcing risk from our counterparties um, to share frameworks with them for how we're thinking about um, these types of risks and, and quantifying them. Um, how we think about impact and not just the economic aspect, but, you know, the, the environmental and societal impact of, of what we're doing. And so to the extent that, you know, we can compare notes, we can listen and learn, and then we can also teach and educate, like others have said, um, you know, we, we very much are of the view that the rising tide raises, raises all boats. And so to the extent that we can share frameworks that we find useful as a jumping off point for others, because no one, no one has the answer. We're all learning this as we go. Um, but, you know, to, to be able to hear, you know, what has worked or what hasn't from others that are in this space, um, that, that's something that we, we certainly want to continue to do. And also, you know, go into different conversations, events like this with, with open minds so that, that we can learn as well. I can share that from a technological point of view, um, I would think that we would need a whole lot of partnerships with the government. Um, so uh, the National Science Foundations, the, uh, the sort of uh, ARPA E's and, and, and Jane, you'll know a bunch of these uh, institutions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, within the government really ramping up their investments and also um, collaborations with even VCs, uh, because many times even the companies that come out of these uh, grant uh, financings uh, are, are quite early stage for venture capitalists uh, or, or institutional financial venture capitalists. So being able to um, really have an active dialogue with Washington uh, and these agencies would be uh, really helpful from at least from a U.S. perspective, and I'm sure there's analogs elsewhere um, globally uh, that, that we could replicate there as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so area for cooperation, the clear one from my point of view, again, just in my little sandbox of public equities, uh, is the, the work that I've heard from the other speakers today that you're doing to quantify both climate risks and also to quantify impact uh, and, you know, with the full admission that it, none of this is going to be perfect. It's going to be a very iterative process. But at the end of the day, what we need to be able to do uh, in, in my business is to get climate risks into line items in the financial statements into our forecasts. That's the only way that uh, we'll really be able or into the valuation, into the DCF or into the multiple be able to back that up with hard hard numbers and you know like what matt was talking about being able to better quantify these risks is um you know absolutely crucial and you know as now the number of companies that are reporting to tcfd is on the you know has been growing even here getting these tcfd reports to be actually useful uh more decision useful and and more easily quantified and built into financial statements and forecasts is the next step. And that's, that's really where, uh, you know, we could work together in, in terms of both frameworks and 
uh, marshalling all of this data that's becoming available from satellites uh, and, and from scraping, et cetera. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. And from my perspective, I think the, the, the conversations like this are, are great because we've got, we'll call it the entire um, investment value chain here. But I think the more that the institutional value chain that is of the larger size can publicly voice the fact that we're looking for pipeline, we're looking for companies, we're looking for emerging, that it can be identified in, in, in broad strokes. It inspires more people to start companies, more diaspora to take technology, to grow things, to try and meet the objectives of whether it be series A, B, C rounds after seed capital, but that they can take that knowing that there's a, there's a marketplace that they can take it that isn't just limited to family offices and high net worths, that they know that there's an appetite that's growing out there for them. And I think that, that that's, a, that's a very inspiring thing for um, entrepreneurs to know. We've already talked about, you know, the extreme valuations that are out there that are causing a sector rotation possibly, you know, in the space as well. And the more that institutions can speak of that sector rotation and the benefit that's there on a long-term basis, the more we're going to see more innovation coming from entrepreneurs to try and be in that space. Therefore, more capital, right? All right, thank you all for uh, the very inspiring uh, conversation. Uh, someone was, you know, uh, asking in the uh, in the chat box, say uh, if there's a way to establish a network of green investors. Um, yeah. So, uh, do you have some recommendations? I'm thinking of maybe we should uh, put together a Slack group just for uh, all type of green investors to be there. Any any ideas? I'm not sure if I have an idea for establishing a network, but I know there's lots and lots of lists online for a whole lot of green. I think Climate Tech VC has a bunch of investor names that that's aggregated online and, and you can just go check them out and uh, reach out to pretty much everyone. Nowadays, it's very easy to reach out to people. Yeah, I think uh, the question is if there is a network people can just are already in the network <laughs> and people can just easily ping each other. So yeah, uh, good, good, uh, good questions and a good um, uh, answers. Uh, and thank you all for the, for the panelists. Uh, it's really uh, fruitful discussion. And I hope all the audience have uh, really enjoyed this conversation and have some uh, inspiration that you can take home and start to grow your own um, your, your, your own work and to mobilize more finance into climate. Um, and thank you again for all the panelists and thanks uh, TDK Venture for the partnership. Uh, I will get back to Yenda. Okay, thanks everyone. And um, please, uh, this is just a kind of reminder that next week we will have session four collaboration. So please register if you are interested in it. Uh, and since it's already pretty late uh, in the East Coast, uh, so thank you all the speakers stay late with us and thank you, thanks all the attendees uh, to engage in our events. Hope everyone enjoy and learn, learn something from it. And I think we are good to stop here and have a good weekend. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. Bye. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you, everyone.